So, good morning. My name is Janani Shri Murli Dharan and I'm an assistant professor here at the mechanical department. So, as part of this heat transfer course, I'm going to take four lectures on phase change heat transfer. And the first two lectures is going to be on boiling. And Thursday and the subsequent Monday is going to be on condensation heat transfer. So, when you're looking at phase change heat transfer, um, I'd like to highlight certain things. So you would be uh, used to seeing a lot of correlations, empiricity and pretty much uh, nothing much beyond you know trying to see vague numbers and plugging them in and getting out your answers. So the reason behind that is phase change is a highly coupled phenomenon and we really do not understand how to model them in a more physical way. So we end up doing experiments and trying to you know, characterize how the pressure or the temperature varies with the bubble size. And we try to kind of use numbers that we have got out of specific experiments and kind of extrapolate it to other conditions. So as part of this lecture, what I've tried to do is give you a little bit of the background of the physics, maybe not go through the entire derivation because it can get quite complicated, but just to give you an appreciation of where the reasoning starts from. So you probably will be looking at setting up the problem and uh, going through some of the physics, but not all the way working out the answers. So when we talk about phase change, uh, in today's lecture, we'll be addressing these topics. So I'm just going to uh, talk about some fundamentals of phase change, a uh, little bit of boiling basics, followed by what are the conditions required for nucleation to occur. Then after it's nucleated, what are the bubble growth dynamics in an ideal scenario? Then in a case where we're really interested in, which is bubble growth at the wall, because we are looking at heat exchangers. So bubble growth at the wall and probably two simple problems to finish with. So all of you must be familiar with this phase change diagram. And it essentially shows that your three phases, solid, liquid, and gas, are governed by, uh, you know, pretty much specified by a specific pressure and a specific temperature. And the boundaries that you see are essentially your equilibrium curves across which the transition of phase, the phase change actually occurs. So along these lines, when you are at any of the pressure and temperature, uh, what we will see is that at that point, your liquid and say the vapor phase is going to coexist. So essentially at that phase change instant, there's going to be an overlap of the phases, right? And as I've told you, we pretty much will be concentrating on the right hand most of the curve, which is your vaporization and condensation, because most of your heat transfer applications in industries are focused on boiling and condensation. So before we go on to phase change details, I just would like you to think about certain everyday applications uh, where you see phase change. So for example, you're down with fever and four or five days down the line, your fever has to reduce. So because your infection is gone and uh, your doctor says it's a good thing that you sweat, right? So what happens? Why does your body trigger the sweat glands to have water on your skin surface. It's essentially because it is trying to lose heat. It wants to bring down its fever. So when it produces these water droplets on your skin, what essentially happens is hoping that phase change happens and heat is removed away from your body and your fever comes down. An extension of the same problem is on a highly humid day when you're sweating profusely and the atmosphere just refuses to dry you up because it's saturated with moisture and it cannot take in any more liquid. So phase change heat transfer does not occur and you're feeling miserable, you can't cool yourself down. So that is another application of phase change. When you're trying to do some cooking in the kitchen and you're boiling water and you spill water on your finger, you're going to end up burning yourself, right? But when you open a pressure cooker and the steam comes in contact with your finger, do you think the nature of the burns are going to be different or are they going to be the same? They're going to be different. Why? 
Yes, exactly. So essentially, it is going to transfer more heat to your finger, even though it's at 100 degrees Celsius. So it is going to lose that bit, extra bit of latent heat to your body. So the final scenario is you're trekking in the Himalayas and you're stuck in a snowstorm, right? You have your electric stove, you, you can do something with it, you have battery powered stuff, but you don't have water with you. You've run out of water. It's a snowstorm. I mean, how bad can it get? Uh, you probably could just stuff the snow down your throat and it should become water, right? But strangely, people do not advise this. It is better to waste some amount of, uh, you know, your stove, your gas and heat up the stuff. Why? So this is a little bit of the numbers involved. So if you're trying to just take water, heat it up in a stuff, you're probably looking at just spending 61.9 kilojoules to heat it up to a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. But say you have snow at minus 5, again to heat it up to 0 degrees is just 4.1. But look at the magnitude of the latent heat. It is 133.6 kilojoules. So if you're going to just put snow in your mouth, your body would be expending that energy and essentially what will happen is you will try you will actually if you consume quite a bit you're going to freeze to death so that is not advice so what i want to actually bring uh, to your attention is that it's not that phase change gives you a mode of heat transfer it's the magnitude of heat transfer so essentially this magnitude is what is sought after by industrialists when they look for an efficient heat transfer procedure. What requires this energy for latent heat transfer? So everybody knows that you have liquid bonds and vapor bonds and the nature between them are quite different. So your liquid is held together more closely, more tightly in a more regular fashion. So essentially to break these intermolecular forces, you need to provide that kind of energy to be able to transfer the liquid into a vapor phase. So when this happens, uh, for example, for water, you're going to pump in energy and provide it just enough energy to be able to, you know, move, break those bonds on the surface, the surface tension and jump into the vapor phase. But you'll have to ensure that this happens at an equilibrium case. So essentially, there must be a saturation pressure, saturation temperature involved and your chemical potential has to be same, right? So when I talk about a saturation temperature required for phase change, then what about evaporation? So you have a puddle of liquid on, this, on the street and it evaporates by itself. You're not heating it up to saturation temperature. So the key distinction between boiling and evaporation is that boiling is a bulk phenomenon. So I told you that molecules are on the surface of the puddle and when the sun is heating it up, one or two discrete molecules manage to capture that energy required to jump across the face and become vapor. But it is not a bulk phenomenon. It is not an entire mass of you know, coherent liquid getting transferred to vapor. And that is what we want to achieve. And to be able to do that, we need to boil the liquid. So when we talk about boiling, there are certain factors which are essential. So we know as of now that you need to retain saturation, temperature, pressure, etc. But that is not all that boiling is. So when you, when you put a pan of liquid to boil on a stove, what do you see happening? Where does boiling start? It starts obviously as the, at the bottom surface which is getting heated, right? So what if you plonk a, a, you know, a ceramic mug in a microwave and heat it up just to the same amount of temperature? More often than not, you would not be able to find it to boil. It will just be a quiescent liquid and you take it out and you're like, it's not boiling. And then you decide that, okay, let me open a coffee powder and you drop it in. You would see that it instantly boils over at that point. Or even if you just stick a stirrer in, it's going to boil over. So essentially, I am heating the same liquid in a different fashion. This was a localized heating process. And what happens, there's natural convection currents that are being set up, which is going to kind of disturb the fluid, push it and disturb cause fluctuations, 
whereas in a microwave it's a bulk heating that is going on so we understand that some kind of disturbance is required for boiling to happen for the phase change to happen right what about different surfaces now we have found in experiments that if you have different surface textures like a hydrophilic or a hydrophobic surface different temperatures are required more often than not it's a superheated temperature it has to be a temperature more than the saturation temperature so why is that the nature of surface play a role in boiling and how does it control boiling does it make it more efficient or inefficient right so i mentioned here that superheating is something that is required that is more than your saturation temperature so if you're looking at something that is more than saturation that sounds quite improbable i just have a video here which is of a super cooled liquid now this is occurring in all phase transfer procedures so you have something some water which is less than 0 degrees so it exists as water and it has still not become ice so we do not know what will trigger this what will trigger this phase change it is super cooled so why hasn't it yet not changed into ice so these people try two methods in the first case they just shake it violently so if you see that super cooled water and it's still water it's not become ice yet and you can see that that shaking has helped transform now in the second case all that shaking is not required we'll see what they do so what they do is they just drop in a single crystal of ice and that was sufficient for the phase change so you need some kind of superheating you need some kind of fluctuation and you need some kind of external presence to ensure boiling so what is this nucleation process one has to understand so essentially nucleation talks about a self assembly of similar molecules in a particular phase it could be homogeneous or heterogeneous so what do what do these terms mean when i talk about homogeneous nucleation what i'm trying to say is that this phase change does not need any external surface for assistance it doesn't need a stirrer it doesn't need an ice crystal it will just change phase but in experiments it has been found that extremely high amount of power is required to effect this process so essentially all normal earth events what you see is heterogeneous nucleation it is nucleation at a particular surface aided by something either it is just your pan which is providing that surface for boiling or it is an ice crystal right so what is the energy that we are talking about so this is some kind of energy that is required for formation so essentially the formation energy for nucleation comprises of three things one is your chemical potential energy second is your surface energy so some kind of favorable surface energy balance has to be reached and the third one is your pressure volume work so when i talk about chemical potential what i mean is that uh you might have different species and they might be reacting in between so in essence some kind of energy must be provided for say diffusion of events for proper redistribution of you know the substance if there is different species so the chemical potential has to be the required requisite chemical potential has to be provided surface energy has to be provided and pressure volume work so in that context when you talk about hydrophilic or hydrophobic surfaces when you have different surfaces essentially it's a surface energy that is changing so one surface might be more favorable for nucleation and hence requires lesser superheat whereas an other surface might be requiring that you pump in way more heat for nucleation to occur so when you talk about nucleation to occur in terms of energy i mentioned something of superheating and we saw that superheating alone or supercooling alone is not sufficient so how does a system exist beyond the saturation temperature 
in a superheated or super cold state. So that is called in uh, literature as a metastable state. So what is this metastable state? Essentially, uh, what the liquid sees, for example, is that it's on that equilibrium curve that you see and it has become 100 degrees Celsius. But it is happy in itself. It is in equilibrium with itself. It doesn't know that there is a vapor phase which it has to change into. So essentially, it's a locally minima which you see, which is like an equilibrium process and it has to be nudged from that by giving some amount of energy, maybe violently shaking it or adding an ice crystal saying, listen, there is some other surface here. And then it wakes up to that fact that it has to actually change its face. So this metastable state can be disturbed by giving fluctuations and those fluctuations are known as heteroflase fluctuations. So those random shakings that you see are called heteroflase fluctuations. Look more closely at what this metastable state is. So let's draw pressure curve, saturation curve or pressure volume diagram. And we know that the vapor is on the right hand side. So you have liquid here at the saturation pressure and then it transitions into vapor at this point. And this happens at say the constant temperature. So this is your constant temperature line. So this is your isotherm. In literature, we are trying to find out what is its existence beyond this saturation curve. So how does the medium exist inside? So there is some equations which you solve to get the distribution to be something of this. So what happens here is that this region AB, this path that it travels is unphysical. So the only physical parts of this curve is your say C and D. So you're talking about AC which is physical and BD was just physical. So I'm not going to the derivations of how these equations, but it's just to make you understand that, so you can see over here that, so I've drawn A, C, B, and D. So in this BD is considered unphysical. So from to this point here is considered unphysical. And somewhere between A and B, you can prove that there is mechanical stability. So mechanical stability in this portion, so let's forget about this. So in this portion, there is mechanical stability, meaning there is a, a system can exist stably, but this portion here is not physically possible. So any kind of fluctuation that will disturb the system will push it to the size, side quite quickly and the next nature of the liquid is to jump to the next vapor phase. So essentially your metastable state in your pressure volume curve is this state over here. So that is your metastable state. And when you disturb the liquid, your fluctuations essentially push it into a region where it cannot exist and it jumps to the vapor phase. When you talk about formation of vapor, what is the kind of Yes. No, this is not in really uh, effect of a correlation. So this is properly you derive from the Gibbs free energy and then you show this path. And of this path, so you, you do a theoretical uh, analysis and then you say you were able to prove that that mechanical stability here does not exist. But this is mechanically stable and a metastable state exists. So that is why your superheated or super cooled liquid can, you know, exist. Uh, physical meaning, mechanical stability is not there. So for example, the, the condition for mechanical stability here I've shown is change of pressure with respect to specific volume should be less than zero. I'm not going into the details of the derivation. So if you see here, this violates that it's greater than zero. So it's a violation of the requirement of stability. So you will not have a system. It, it will just bypass that, that condition. It will not go through it. So though you're theoretically deriving it through equations, it's, it's a non-physical state, right? 
No, here you will not, it won't go through this state at all. So when you're talking about uh, metastable state, then we want to know about superheating. So I'm, I'm, I've talked about having some kind of uh, external system, having a surface energy being balanced and all of this sort. But I, if, what if you can give all this energy when the system is superheated, when the system is just saturated? Why do I need to superheat the system? I don't have to superheat the system. Yes, one thing is it's easier to disturb it, to push it, so lesser energy might be required. But that all, that all cannot be the driving factor. So the important fact is we are talking about nucleation, a bulk transformation. So your superheat is required for this case. So let me do just a small derivation here to show you how that is the case. So for phase change to happen, there are three things that you would be repeatedly using. So you have a system and you're trying to nucleate a bubble, say pressure PV, and the system is superheated at TL and at pressure PL. So you would repeatedly be dealing with three equations, which is PV minus PL is two sigma by R, R being the radius here. So this is essentially your mechanical balance to, to maintain that pressure difference. The second thing is your uh, kind of thermal equilibrium formula which you will be using, which is your clausius clapeyron equation, which talks about the change in pressure with respect to temperature, and this is specific volume change. So this is your second equation. And the third equation is talks about the chemical equilibrium with the gibbs duhem equation, which talks about the change in the chemical potential with respect to the system properties. So essentially, it's three, three equations that's, that you will be briefly revisiting at different points. Okay, so as far as this case is concerned, when you're trying to do, trying to understand why superheat is required, we will go and access this particular equation here. So we do know that for such a system to exist, yes, you need your mechanical equilibrium to sigma by r but when you come to your chemical equilibrium now let's look at the liquid phase the liquid phase exists at a superheated temperature tl and at a pressure pl the vapor exists at pv pressure and the temperature is at the constant temperature case when we try and apply this over here it's a constant temperature case so this goes to zero so essentially you have d mu say from any saturation case to the uh, liquid uh, tl situation that is your this state over here and vdp integrated along that same way so you will be actually doing this integration first for the liquid which will give you the equation mu l is equal to mu sat at l plus we P uh, just get confused with the differences. So this is when you integrate this for the liquid case. And for your vapor case, you will have a similar equation, but you're assuming ideal gas. So you will be looking at RT L ln PV minus P sat. So you have equation one equation 2 and 3. Now when in a real case you plot this on a graph what you get is something like this. So essentially when you come to this graph over here so let me write equation 1 also over here. Right. So when you look at that graph over there, that's the graph you will get on plotting the mu equation. So it goes something like, <laughs> so what does this graph represent? Essentially, AC corresponds to the change in potential for liquid. So AC is the liquid line, whereas DB, DBE is the vapor line. Of these lines, 
the stable portions are A and B, A to B for liquid and B to E for vapor. The portions that you see that are left over are the metastable state portions. Okay, and this common point B is nothing but your saturation point, P sat. So when you go through all those three equations, you end up with the relation that you see over there. And the form of that relation is such that it essentially indicates, let's not go and go into two details, essentially indicates that your vapor pressure, that is your vapor pressure, is close to your saturation pressure. So essentially this is your saturation point and your vapor pressure tends to be on the vapor line, on the stable vapor line at this particular location over here. Let's look at our system again. There are two conditions that has to be met. I said for phase change to occur, you need your chemical potential to be the same. And for nucleating a bulk phase, you need PV minus PL equal to 2 sigma by R. Now you know the vapor phase PV over here and that has a mu L. Where does it touch the mu L part? So it has a mu V but that has to be equal to mu L. So it contacts the liquid line only in the metastable state. Secondly, so you can say can I extend it and is, is there going to be a second intersection or something of that sort but another second point is going to be that PV minus PL must be equal to 2 sigma by R. So this distance is fixed. So all this is only to show you that you need superheat to be able to nucleate a bubble of radius R. That is why you need the superheat. So I didn't go into too much detail of the math but I think this kind of puts in perspective why you need that superheat. So now you have talked about nucleating a bubble. So once you've nucleated a bubble with a superheat, T superheat, what you need to do is look at how it grows because that is an important part of heat transfer. So when you're looking at bubble growth dynamics, then there's something that we have to understand. The bubble growth pattern can be of two types. One is your inertia control growth and the other is your heat transfer control growth. So we have a liquid which is superheated and you have a bubble that is just nucleated with that superheat. So at this stage what happens is that your liquid right next to the interface is still going to be superheated. So there's still a lot of heat that is involved right at the interface and if it wants to grow all it needs to do is access that superheat right next to the interface. So what is controlling the growth? Essentially its ability to push the liquid around it. So it is, it is a momentum controlled or inertia controlled growth initially. So that is the beginning process. Now as it consumes heat at this location the temperature here is going to drop and what happens is that a thermal boundary layer slowly develops. And the temperature across this thermal boundary layer is going to vary from T sat to the superheated liquid temperature. So once this medium is reached, what happens is that your growth is no longer controlled by the infinite axis of heat or momentum. You are controlled only by the amount of heat transfer that can be achieved across this thermal boundary layer. So that phase is called the heat controlled growth. So there are two extreme factors. One is your inertia control growth and the other is your heat control growth. And somewhere in between you have the transition period which is modeled differently. To look at how this bubble growth in an inertia control case happens. So you have a bulk vapor that is formed PL, TL and there is PV. So if you look at how this interface is growing, so radius R and there's liquid surrounding it and this interface at this location is moving with a capital velocity 
you. So mass conservation meaning the interface is pushing the liquid and the entire liquid is moving forward. So what that requires is 4 pi r square capital U, this has the unit of meter cube per second, right? And this pushes the liquid and say the liquid has a velocity small u at a distance r can be equated to 4 pi small r square right so you can get the relationship so you can essentially get a formulation formulation for your velocity at uh, so this becomes capital u capital r square by small r square this is nothing but at this location r capital r by t so this is one expression here that we have now what happens when this liquid pushes, when this vapor interface pushes the liquid? You're imparting kinetic energy, right? So the kinetic energy equation can be written as integral from R, that is your interface, to infinity half rho L u square dv, right? So you substitute for u square into that and your v is nothing but 4 by 3 pi r cube because it's going to be traversing through that. So when you integrate this, what you get is, so you'll get an expression something like this, not going through the integration, it's pretty simple, dr by dt the whole square r cube. So essentially, your interface has imparted this kinetic energy into that liquid. Okay, so for this interface to impart it, what does it have to do? It has to push against the liquid. So what is the work done by that interface? This work done is the work done for it to form But all of it doesn't go into adding kinetic energy, right? There is some resistance from the outside fluid. So whatever kinetic energy is left over in the system is after it has overcome that surrounding resistance. So minus that resistance work. So this network is what comes as the kinetic energy of the fluid. So this work done can be written as integral zero 2R, the pressure right near the interface is PLI because that's the kind of work that it has to do. PLI 4 pi R square or capital R square because we're talking about the bubble dr minus the entire resistance is nothing but 4 by 3 pi R cube into P infinity P in or PL here in this case. So essentially, if you equate this to this, meaning whatever work your bubble has done has gone in as a kinetic energy. And this, when you solve, you will get a complex, uh, well, not a complex, well, it's quite involved. So you will land up with, and then you differentiate it, so on and so forth, you will land up with that equation. So the beginning parts of it is this. It is essentially that you're trying to do a work and energy balance. And this is known as the Raleigh's equation of bubble growth. And this is inertia control growth. You've looked only about the kinetic energy and the work done. And you make a simplification over here because it is inertia control growth, meaning it is something that happens right at the beginning. What happens is that your bubble is very small, meaning your pressure difference is pretty high. So we make the approximation that the PV minus P infinity, P infinity here I mean is, um, is nothing but your um, PL over here, 2 sigma by R. If you do the 2 sigma by R and then solve the differential equation, eventually you'll arrive at this here. What is this formula? It is 
the rate of change of your bubble with time how does your radius of the bubble grow with time and this is the inertia controlled growth formulation so essentially it is this formula that you need to know and if you notice the relation it is a linear relation so with time it linearly increases as in for heat transfer control growth you will see that it varies as a square root of time meaning the growth rate is slower at a heat transfer control growth because it's waiting for that heat to be provided across the thermal boundary layer now for the heat transfer control growth it gets a little bit more complicated so what happens is that as i told you there's a thermal boundary layer that's formed and it varies between the saturation temperature to the superheated temperature so you'll have to solve the energy the temperature equation across this thermal boundary layer which is there so you can see that we have taken in care of some amount of convection and some amount of conduction the mass balance or the mass conservation is still there you have the u expression over there and let's look at the inertia initial and boundary conditions here so the initial condition is that everywhere it's going to be superheated temperature it's shown as t infinity which is essentially tl over here and after some time at your interface it's going to become t saturated whereas in the far off liquid it continues to be superheated an important condition is that at this interface your heat transfer is controlled by the conduction across that thermal boundary layer so this is the key thing that you need to know that the conduction heat transfer across the thermal boundary layer will govern the phase change and this again gives up comes up into a highly complicated thing and people do not uh, actually solve it entirely and they have opted for some kind of uh, approximation simplifications and they come up with that kind of an expression over there which is purely based on a lot of approximations and some experiments so you have as you can see the radius as a square root of time an important feature i'd like to point out here is that your ja is known as the jacob number and it's a non dimensionalized number that you'll find in a lot of places as far as boiling is concerned so what is this ratio it is the ratio of sensible heat that is rho cp delta t so sensible heat required to keep a medium at its superheated level to the amount of heat at that point taken for phase change so it kind of gives you effectiveness of the boiling so now when you're talking about two limiting factors inertia controlled and heat transfer controlled so jacob number essentially is the ratio of the sensible heat that is required to keep a system in superheat so when you have phase change it's going to slightly drop in temperature right so there needs to be some amount of uh, superheat that still needs to be retained that to how much heat transfer how much latent heat is required for a phase change at that saturation temperature and pressure so when you're talking about a transition now so you've looked about inertia and heat transfer so in this graph you can see that inertia belongs to one limiting end and diffusion or heat transfer controlled is to the other limiting end what we need to do is try and build a model which does not stick at two different ends but which merges all this and transitions so that is what mikik did and he came up with this model over here wherein uh, it can model both inertia intermediate that is your transition and your heat transfer control growth so he has one thing i like to point out here is that he has a dimensionless time over here and if you note carefully the dimensionless time of approximately 1 falls in the intermediate case 0.01 below onwards it's inertia controlled and above 100 it's diffusion controlled so in case you're asked to find out what the radius is like in an intermediate controlled growth phase then this is the kind of non dimensionalized timelines you're looking at it's just to be good to be aware of the timelines for bubble growth right so we have talked about highly idealized conditions of growth which is you know in an infinite pool of liquid uh, growing at uh, you know inertia control growth heat transfer control growth but what we are really interested is is bubble growth at the wall because we need the heat uh, 
transfer to be uh, you know useful in industrial situations so heat growth uh, or bubble growth at the wall is a cyclic process so we know that bubble growing on a surface the surface has a lot of roughnesses and the way boiling people look at it they look at it as crevices on the wall or they call it as cavities on the wall so essentially your surface is going to be something like this but they view it as cavities on the wall and the theory is that you have trapped air inside these cavities inside your pan and when you heat up what happens is that your liquid slowly gets heated up that is your natural convection on the right hand side that kind of provides the superheat and in combination with this external surface and this trapped air similar to that ice crystal it is able to start nucleating so vapor phase happens over here and the bubble slowly grows and afterwards as it grows there's going to be a force balance that is required that is your buoyancy force versus your surface tension force which is holding the liquid to the wall once the buoyancy force is significant enough it's going to depart so when it departs there's going to be cool liquid quenching the wall and then the process continues so this is a cyclic process and this is called the bubble evolution cycle which essentially talks about how the cavity gets replenished with air how it continues to grow so when you talk about this what we need to know really is there is a cyclic process but what kind of bubble sizes can i form at a particular superheat essentially you would like to know that so let's look at this very simple question over here for water at one atmosphere estimate the critical bubble radius for liquid superheat so for superheat levels of 2 10 and 40 degrees so you have liquids at those three superheats what is the kind of bubble sizes you're going to form so again bringing your attention back to those three equations i gave you which is the young's laplace equation pv minus pl equal to 2 sigma by r right this is your mechanical stability and you have your clauges clapeyron equation so to have a superheat of dt to have a pv minus pl so this is t sat t infinity because so all you need to do is take this equation club it with this equation and you've got a radius and that is that equation so that's the formula to get the radius of a bubble to form for different superheats i have done the calculation for the three superheats and i'd like to point out an interesting thing you can see that with increasing superheat smaller bubble sizes can be formed smaller nucleation is possible what do we get out of it from a normal surface in boiling what people think of is that when you have a cavity they assume and it's a very big assumption that they make they assume that your initial nucleation size the radius is same as the cavity size so this is a strong assumption that they make and i told you that the surface is filled with different cavity sizes so it is logical to think that different cavities are going to get activated and you have bubbles of different sizes forming so if you would look at say this is the surface and there is a t superheat that is maintained and the far off liquid is at a t saturation temperature and this is the distance y so initially think about the bubble evolution tire cycle which i talked about initially when you're just having the liquid quench and starting to heat up again your temperature profile is going to be like this slowly the liquid is going to get heated up right so it's a transient process where your temperature lines are going to follow this pattern now going back to this assumption that a bubble nucleates at the size of radius r it follows that i need superheated temperature till this point till this distance r so the important thing that i would like to tell you here is that 
So initially you might have you know cavities of a smaller size which have temperature up to this but as the temperature extends and becomes higher bigger bubbles can form. So essentially there is a range of cavities that can become active on the surface and it is given by that formula there and uh, I think we are up with time and I'd like to finish at this point and we'll pick it up from here in the next class. Thank you.